This is it. Right? Do you doubt the truth? And how does he start it? The horn. He honks the fucking horn, you guys. Isn't that some shit? And in this video, you guys, we are going to understand the truth, okay? Now, one reason why I showed you a few previous clips from a few episodes before this is so that we can not only stay on a direct path within our understanding and what we're doing in this mystery, but so that you can understand exactly what this whole series is about. The truth, okay, this series in particular, is understanding literal truths about this mystery that we were supposed to understand from day one, okay? Things that are supposed to be clarified, okay, that are honestly held with a shred of faith, but understood greatly throughout the game and implied millions of times over so that they can understand and build into bigger clues as we go along. Now, throughout my last few episodes, I brought a lot of relevancy within music, okay? Music. If it's one thing throughout this mystery that I brought up is the fact that Apollo, okay, the god of music, is a big part of our philosophies and how we figure certain things out. But this music, okay, is exactly what I mean by us understanding GTA, but also other elements of the mystery like GTA's past and their history with certain people that they have used within their history, okay? Because understand, they care a lot about people who were involved with their games and people that explain things about their games they care, okay? And they want you to care just as much to find things that you want, like a jetpack. Now, without me ranting on too much, I'm going to run by these things and... If you haven't noticed one thing, it's a dream, okay? In several episodes, I've come to several different bits of truth, and that is aspects of a dream, okay? But this is what I mean by understanding the clues and segregation as they lie, okay? Tangerine dream, all right? It's something very interesting within GTA, and I would like to share with you exactly why it's interesting and why it implies with things that they have been implying the entire time. Now, this here is Tangerine Dream, okay? Ran by Mr. Edgar Froze. Now, I'm going to be very brief about this so that we can understand some of the more deeper clues along the way. The fact of the matter here is that this motherfucker is very known, okay, for his band, but especially for the scores that he has done tied to Grand Theft Auto. Now, one of the other soundtracks that it did, okay, are tied to a few movies, and the reason why I'm showing you this here is so that we can understand the relevance towards the clues that we have gained so far within the mystery and why they gained stronger clues to bring a resolution. Now, what I mean by this is a movie called Legend. Now, this movie... Legend, okay, is something very, very interesting tied to a great Scott, Mr. Ridley Scott, okay. This was directed by Mr. Ridley Scott. Now, if you're asking yourself why Ridley Scott is even relevant within what we're talking about here, this motherfucker did the movie Alien, okay. Now, understand, once again, you guys, Ripley's Believe It or Not, okay, and 
all of the clues that have been tying us to different clues like Bishop and even Bishop's what the fuck that tie us right back into Alien, Bill Paxton and all of those clues tie us right back into aspects of the mystery that we have been learning, okay? A legend. There are things within a legend that we need to understand that are very universal. And I'll show you what I mean. Now, aside from the fact that Tangerine Dream, okay, is what gave us an ounce of understanding that brought us here, we need to understand the people within this movie and why they are big clues and why we have understood them before and why we are gaining the stronger connections into what we are looking for and what we are looking at. Tom Cruise, okay? He plays Jack within this movie. Or Miss Mia Sarah, who played Lily within this movie, okay? She also played <laughs> in Time Cop, Jack and the Beanstalk, and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yep. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Even Mr. Tim Curry within this movie who plays Darkness, okay? Now, what's interesting about Mr. Tim Curry is that he starred in a lot of things, but his most notable role was playing the father on the Wild Thornberries. Now, the Wild Thornberries was about a young, red-headed female, okay, who actually got the power to talk to animals from a shaman, okay, a shaman, but we need to understand certain connections here, like a monkey named Darwin by Mr. Tom King. Call me when you're ready. We are about to put the Darwinism back in social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. And brother, it is going to be fun. So understand, you guys, that these characters within this movie, okay, and the cast are all segregative clues, no different than the things that we have looked up before. Even Screwball. See, a lot of people, when they figured out that the Ultras Camp Rock, okay, showed the jetpack, they linked, once again, certain things together. No different than what I'm doing. But they linked them very dryly without going deeper. Like, Remembering that R108 is 108 minutes, and this is within a confirmation towards the Rocketeer, and even a jetpack confirm, okay? But we need to understand that that was not the only message that we can get out of that message, and that is one big understanding to why segregating and rearranging, okay, is a tricky thing, and it's not to be misunderstood. But if there's one thing we needed to understand here is that this was a duality, okay, of the cocketeer, you guys. And in the cocketeer, all right, this shit was directed, okay, by Scotty Fox, all right? And it actually featured the one who played Joker or his name within the porno called Screwball, Segregative Clues. So now understanding that legend, okay, is relevant in more ways than one, we need to understand exactly why it's relevant within this mystery and why they are pointing towards certain aspects of the movie itself, okay? I need you guys to understand this here. Jack encounters the elf honey thorn gump, okay? Now I want you to understand and remember that, Jack, okay? There's something very interesting about certain things that we don't get, okay, like where words come from, or even origins of certain words and distinctions between certain things, like why they would mention Jack Sheep, or even certain aspects of Jack being tied to this movie, or even Jack and the Beanstalk, and so on and so forth. We need to understand certain things. Chapter 5, verse 1, Tau, of the Epsilon Tract.
only the apple tree and the peach tree speak. These are the trees that we came from. Now, without being too confused, I want you guys to understand exactly why this movie is relevant and why it's going to teach us other things, okay, and deeper things. Princess Lily, okay, and Mia Sarah, all right, goes alone into a forest to meet her friend Jack, Tom Cruise, who's a forest dweller, all right? Now, I want you to understand Jack, the forest dweller, all right? I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by the relevancy here and why trees speak. Jack O. the Green, okay, also accredited as Jack and was played by Tom Cruise in the film Legend. Now, what I'm showing you here are aspects of relevancy into things that we have looked at before into universal clues, okay? Not only the 1980s, but within Rochester Sweeps Festival, okay, the Jack in the Green ceremony was held on Blue Bell Hill, okay, at sunrise, okay? So once again, all of these clues that conform together to teach us certain things and why things are relevant, and even the reason why... <laughs> Some trees speak, okay? Now, this is no different than within understanding the metaphors within the Epsilon tract and why Jack in the green, okay, is basically a tree person. You're so clever. Tell me our future. Not today. Why not? Because... There's something really special that I've been promising to show you. Boys, go now. Because I'll be here for a short while. They will near us. Evil can never harm the pure of heart. Do you speak the language? They express only love and laughter. Dark thoughts are unknown to them. Jack? It was lovely. Like a dream. It's my right to set a challenge for my suitors. I will marry whoever finds this ring. This ring. Presence 
returns to torment me. Enter! the most loathsome of my goblins. Truly, master. And is your heart black and full of hate? Black as midnight, black as pitch, blacker than the foulest witch. Something troubles me. I feel a presence in the forest. A force I had mercifully almost forgotten. Must be dread indeed to trouble you, Lordship. Looking upon these frail creatures, one would not think that they could contain such power. One could rule the universe with it. You must find them for me and destroy them. What do they look like, Lord? <laughs> Let this serve to remind you. The creature is crowned with a single spiral, reaching like an antenna straight to heaven. I get the point, Lord. Bring the horns to me. Where should I look, sire? There is only one lure for such disgusting goodness. One bait that never fails. What be this bait? Please, you teach me. Innocence. Innocence. So now what we're going to do here is understand a bit of evidence, okay? Innocence. The two most innocent people, literally, in this game are these two. Lloyd and Deborah. okay? They literally do nothing throughout the game. And the only time that they ever get to the point of doing something is when they encounter Trevor and Trevor screws up their innocence. Now, this is what I mean. Listen to Deborah. Get out of my condo! And you go too, Floyd! I told you! I've got a career! I don't need this! 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 Crap! Yes! Yeah. <laughs> you made me swear. Now, I ask you guys, why would the game imply so much and why would they care to let the audience know that you made her swear or you made her sin, ruining her innocence. Is it? So, this is where Floyd is gonna meet us at strip club? Oh yeah. That guy like him, he's a real homebody. He loves that apartment. Interestingly, you and me, we got a new home. Where? At the Vanilla Unicorn. Here! Mm, right here! Here? Mm, here. Now, I know it's unconventional, but that's the way we roll. Tell me where the manager is going to find establishment. Through there and take two doors to the right. Mm -hmm. There. To the right. Thank you. Amigo! Where to meet your new partner. Now, think about it, you guys. He did not buy the Vanilla Unicorn, you guys. Okay? In a game where we buy several different businesses with each character, they could have gave us an option to buy this property. But this is the one property, the one, that Trevor fucking steals. Think about it. He steals the Unicorn. Why? They put a figure of a horn. Now, you know what I find interesting? I actually got a lot of hate on that video. I remember when I actually did it, um, a lot of people <laughs> came at me like, you know, I'm just forming bullshit out of the map. But I'm going to show you once again why that unicorn was real and why, once again, these things are being pointed out at a top-down perspective. Innocence Boulevard. Okay? Again, I'm not making this shit up. You can look it up yourself. Innocence Boulevard is on literally the back and the horn of the unicorn that I saw months ago, you guys. 
Coincidence? Seriously?
that must be kept. <laughs> now, fulfill your promise. I will miss you. But don't forget us. Counters the elf, elf, honey, thorn, gump. Okay. So ask yourself, is this the reason why Children of the Mountain, Franklin's cult, actually has a banner that says find out about your elf on the mountains? Or is this the reason why <laughs> right next to it it says pick your ring? Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Just know that this is only part one. In part two, there will be much more. <laughs>